although the majority of my library is related to World War II material, there are a fair few books that cover other conflicts, and in them there are the occasional story that come across that is just so bizarre that I can't help but share it with you guys. When World War One broke out, the German Navy was in a very different position to that which it would find itself in a quarter of a century later, in that there were various civilian ships tied up or arriving in ports all around the globe, which it had the opportunity to co-opt into military service. In addition to the deployment of both her surface fleet and her U-boat arm, the Imperial Navy also took the liberty of arming a percentage of her country's merchant fleet. And in doing so, they would create a series of infamous merchant raiders in the process. And these ships would play absolute havoc with British merchant shipping and tie down a significant part of the Royal Navy chasing them in the process. Now, intriguingly, in addition to this, they also took the slightly contentious decision to arm a number of luxury cruise liners as well for exactly the same purpose. Now, these gigantic but poorly armed ships didn't stand a chance against even the smallest of Royal Navy battleships. But if used correctly, they could still inflict significant damage on British shipping and force the Royal Navy to commit precious resources into looking for them. When the war was declared, one such ship had just arrived in Buenos Aires, having completed her maiden voyage, and she was called the Cap Trafalgar. 23,500 tonnes and capable of accommodating up to 1,600 passengers. It was with a little bit of bemusement then that her captain, when he reported to the German embassy, was informed that his brand new cruise ship with the paint hardly being wet on it was to be converted into a surface raider and taken from him and placed under the command of a, a military naval officer named Julius Wirth. So over the next few weeks, uh, in addition to a couple of four-inch guns and some smaller pieces which had been added from another ship, great efforts were made to hide the Cap Trafalgar's true identity. After some conversation, uh, it was decided that the best chance that the Cap Trafalgar had to deceive and surprise any enemy vessels they came across was to disguise her as a British liner of roughly the same size and tonnage, named the Carmania. So as a result, one of her three funnels was removed and her hull was painted in the same colours as the Cunard shipping line, which was the company that had operated the Carmania before the war. Now at the rear of the Cap Trafalgar was a slightly problematic area in that the company that constructed it had built a large glass greenhouse, a bit odd, uh, which was known as the Winter Gardens. So the only means that they had of disguising that was essentially just to paint over the glass from the outside and make it look like it was just part of the hull and then leave circular gaps in the paint to look like portholes around it for it to blend in with the rest of the disguise. When the work was finally completed, Captain Verth received orders to sail up and down the South American coast and surprise and sink any enemy merchant ships that he came across. What followed were a series of very uneventful patrols and it wasn't that long before the captain found himself running very short of coal uh, and raided up for further orders. And he was informed that a, uh, a coal collier which had been organised by the German expat community in South America, uh, would be sent to rendezvous somewhere with him. That meeting was to take place at a remote archipelago, 13,000 miles away from the nearest land, uh, named 
the Trinidad and Martin Vaz Islands. On the morning of the 14th of September, 1914, as the ship was lying at anchor, waiting for a collier, the lookout suddenly called down to the captain and informed him that another cruise liner had sailed into the archipelago uh, and was making its way towards them. And as Captain Verth stared through his binoculars, he was stunned to see what appeared to be a mirror image of his own ship now steaming towards him, exactly as it had looked only a few months before he had taken command and disguised it as another ship. In a twist of fate that it's almost impossible to calculate, the cruise liner that was sailing towards him, painted in German shipping colours and with three funnels, was actually the Carmania, which was the exact vessel that the Germans had been pretending to be. As with most British liners, the Admiralty had insisted that when she was constructed back in Britain, uh, traverse rings that could have artillery pieces placed on them had been built into her deck. So when war broke out, Carmania found herself very quickly fitted with eight 4.7-inch guns uh, and repainted to hide her Cunard colouring. She was given orders to patrol the coast of South America in an effort to flush out any German merchant raiders that might be hiding away in the various islands, uh, inlets and channels there. And the day before she arrived at the archipelago, her captain, Noel Grant, had been informed that there had been suspected German radio traffic there and had been ordered to go in uh, and investigate and locate any German shipping there. Now, Grant was aware that the Germans employed passenger liners the same as his own as raiders, and he gave orders that a third funnel, a false funnel, be erected at the back of the Carmania in an effort to convince any German ships they came across that she was a German liner, the same as the Cap Trafalgar. As a result, that afternoon, the Cap Trafalgar found herself sitting at anchor, disguised as the Carmania, being approached by the Carmania that was disguised as the Cap Trafalgar. There was a brief pause in proceedings whilst both captains tried to make sense of what was going on before Captain Grant signalled for the German ship to identify itself and raised his pennant. Realising that a battle between the pair was inevitable, Verth immediately gave orders for the Cap Trafalgar to head on for her opponent and open fire. But her crew had very little training and very little gunnery experience, and the volley that they fired was way too high and caused very little damage to the British ship. Moments later, Carmania replied uh, with much more accurate fire, smashing the Winter Garden to pieces at the back of the German ship and scoring several direct hits on a bridge in the process. It took Verth several minutes to wrestle his ship back on course, and when he'd finally done so, he brought it to a halt within about a 1,000 yards of the Carmania, uh, and the pair at that point began to pummel each other, slugging it out like a pair of boxers for the next two hours. This must class as one of the most bizarre naval battles in history. Both ships were being commanded by military officers who had no experience of sailing them, with civilian crews who had no experience of battle, in ships that were far too large for them to handle and with nowhere near enough firepower to pick a fight with someone. Lacking basic fire control systems or damage repair teams, it was hardly surprising that minutes into the engagement, both ships were on fire uh, with casualties mounting. And as the battle wore on, it looked like the Carmania was going to be the first to succumb as she was ablaze from stem to stern and she sustained a total of 79 direct hits from the Germans. But at this point, two hours in, one of Carmania's shells exploded against the hull of the German ship, just at the waterline, as it did so, collapsing several compartments and bulkheads. A few minutes later, Cap Trafalgar began to heel uncontrollably off to her port-hand side and sink, and when she went down, she took 51 of her crew with her. 
unable to continue the fight and barely afloat herself, Carmania immediately broke off the attack. She had multiple casualties of her own to contend with, as well as the fires to put out. Aboard the Cap Trafalgar, with most of her lifeboats having been destroyed during the battle, the majority of the crew were forced to swim for the shore, which was frustrated by the particular area they were in being full of sharks, and they lost more of their number as they did so. One of them who did make it to shore was Captain Verth. Sadly, he had been injured when the bridge was hit, and although he did make it ashore, he uh, suffered a heart attack and died not long afterwards. And with both ships having radioed what was taking place to their respective commands, there was then a short waiting game to see whose rescuers would be the first to arrive. In the end, it were the British ships and the German survivors were detained and would spend the rest of the war in internment in Argentina. Carmania was just about afloat and was towed to a neutral port and repaired. During the following year, despite a series of victories, every single one of Germany's other merchant raiders had been successfully hunted down by the Royal Navy and had been captured or destroyed. And with the German fleet bottled up in their ports, directly avoiding an engagement, it would fall to the submarine fleet to bear the burdens of the rest of the war.